I'm back with another mystery video. I was gonna say horror video then. Sorry, I've got horror films on the brain. I look the same as I did in well, last week's video, which was supposed to go up on Sunday, but it went up on Wednesday. So I'm sorry about that, but I'm filming these two together because this is one of the only days I have free to film. So today I'm going to be talking about the disappearance of the Sodder children, which I've seen quite a few videos on and I've seen quite a lot of I was doing a bit of research and there was quite a bit of contradiction, co contradictory <laughs> research and evidence on this. So I'm going to try my best. Obviously some of this might not be 100% true but I, like I said in every one of these videos, I try my best to be as accurate as I can and get the most reliable sources but yes we shall just get started because this is such a, such a heartbreaking case um, and it's just such a strange story to talk about so there's a lot of theories. So. Yes, we shall just get started. Okay, so just a little bit of background to start off with about the family. So we're gonna talk about the parents, George and Jenny Sodder. They were both Italian immigrants who moved to America when they were very young. Many people describe them as being a couple who strived to reach the American dream. They were hard workers and they just kind of both had this goal of this perfect American lifestyle. George eventually came to own his own truck company in West Virginia, a town called Fayette Fayetteville, I think is how you pronounce it. Throughout their lives they had a total of 10 children. They all lived um, in an area just kind of just north of Fayetteville so I think it's kind of classed under Fayetteville. So in terms of George Sodder there was a few issues around his beliefs. He was very, he was said to be very strong and open with his um, quite controversial beliefs. He was openly very against Mussolini. Um, he was supported by many many Italian Americans um, under the the idea of making Italy great again and I think George just kind of was very outspoken with his beliefs and it wasn't always something that went down very well in his area amongst other Italian Americans so there was a lot of controversy there. It's said that during the war George received numerous threats uh, because of this controversy that he he created pretty much um, from other Italian Americans both in the area and just further out just threatening him, his family, everything like that so like I said a lot a lot of controversy <laughs> so now coming on to the actual event that we're talking about so the event took place on christmas eve 1945 the sod family were celebrating christmas obviously it's christmas eve they were all together with nine out of the ten children their eldest son was soon to be returning home because the war had finished so he was returning home soon um joe is the eldest son's name marion who is 17 years old she's the eldest daughter um, she surprised the younger, younger siblings with a bunch of presents because she'd been working at, I think it was called, I think it was a dime store. And she basically just surprised them with a bunch of presents. So um, she bought the youngest children gifts. So the youngest children, I have a list here. Um, the youngest children were Martha, who was 12, Jenny, who was 8, and Betty, who was 5. They did have a younger, younger sibling, um, Sylvia, who's 2 but she's only two, so she was a lot more little. Jenny's account said that the younger children stayed up later, past their bedtime, which they had done before, but um, they were told by the parents that they could do, as long as the two eldest boys, which was Maurice, who was 14, and Louis, who was nine, um, remembered to check the cows and feed them before they go to bed, and also, um, oh, feed the chickens before they went up to bed. So as long as they did those jobs, they were allowed to stay up late. George, the dad, and um, the two eldest siblings, who were boys, were already asleep because they'd all been working together. So the eldest boys were John, who was 23, and George Jr., who's 16. Um, they'd been working together all day, so they'd already been in bed while this was all going down. And then once she told the kids that they could stay up late as long as they did these jobs, Jenny took Sylvia, who was two years old, up to bed. Sorry there's a lot of names and ages. I'm trying to keep all as organised as I can so you guys can sort of get the picture. So this is when it all starts happening. Um, Jenny said that at 12.30 the phone rang and she woke up, went downstairs to answer the phone. When she answered the phone she said that it was a woman's voice that she didn't recognise. Bless you! Um, yeah, so she said that the woman's voice she didn't recognise and the woman asked for a name that she had never heard before, she was unfamiliar. She told them that it, it, she didn't know and then she said she heard laughter in the background and clinking glasses. When she told them that they had the wrong number, um, Jenny says she recalled the woman having a distinctly weird laugh, so she just kind of hung up and went back to bed, didn't really think much about it at the time because obviously it happens. As she returned back 
up to bed, she noticed when she walked past the room where the kids had been um, that the lights were all still on and the curtains were still open. Just something she said that the kids were used to doing. They used to um, making sure the curtains are shut and turn the lights up every time they go to bed because obviously they stayed up late before. But Marion, the 17 year old eldest daughter, was asleep on the couch or the sofa. So Jenny assumed that she saw the eldest daughter and figured that the other kids had already gone up to bed and Marion had just fallen asleep before she'd gotten the chance to turn the lights off and draw the curtains. The other kids slept in the attic so she didn't um, think to go up and check on them she just assumed that because they were in the attic they can like they were up there they were fine so she drew the curtains she turned the lights off and went back to bed. Ginny then says she woke up again at 1am to the sound of something hitting the roof and then like a rolling sound. She stayed up a little bit just to make sure that it didn't happen again just see if she could hear the noise again but she said there was nothing else after that so she fell back asleep again obviously it happens you hear a weird noise in the night and you make sure that nothing else makes a noise and then you go back to bed so she didn't really think much of it at the time she then said half an hour later she woke up again to the smell of smoke so she got up and saw that there was a fire in George's office or the study that George used for his work along with the telephone line and the fuse box so obviously they're quite drastic um elements they're quite in, important elements within the house so when all this was on fire she woke George and the eldest children because um, I think they're the eldest ones didn't sleep in the attic parents escaped the house with four of the children Marion um, the 17 year old Sylvia the two year old John the 23 year old and George Jr the 16 year old as they were frantically getting out of the house they said they called up numerous times towards the attic to wake up the, ch the younger children when they realized they were getting no response from the children in the attic they initially planned to run upstairs and grab them, but when they got there, they saw that the stairs were on fire, so they physically couldn't get up to the attic. So the parents and the four kids were outside the house, and the telephone line was on fire, so they had to, um, obviously they couldn't call anyone, so Marion, the 17-year-old, had to run to the neighbour's house. So while she was running over there to call the fire department, George decided that he would try and break into the attic window to try and get the youngest kids out, because they realised that they were outside the house and they couldn't see the youngest kids, so they must still be in the house. George broke the attic window, and I think it said that he cut his arm in the process or something, just obviously falling glass. George and the eldest boys, um, they had this plan to break the window, and used the ladder that was always on the side of the house to climb up there and get the kids out which is obviously a pretty simple plan but one of the weirdest things is that when they went to grab the ladder um it wasn't anywhere to be found there is they said that there is a spot that the ladder is always in because obviously they use it when they're working and things it's always in the same spot down the side of the house like leaning against it and they couldn't find it anywhere which was weird like it was nowhere nearby they searched sorry it's my phone they searched and could not find this ladder so they had to kind of quickly think of another plan. They also said that there was this big water barrel nipped just outside the house that could have been used to put out the fire, but it was completely frozen solid, which is so weird. Like, it's it's it seems as if someone had purposely planned this and perpetrated this, um, considering every possibility, considered every possible route the solids could go down to help put out this fire and completely ruined their chances. So this water barrel was frozen solid and then George's plan was to pull up um, both of the trucks he'd been using for his work up to the house so that he could try and then climb in the attic window but as he went to grab them um, with his sons neither of them worked despite working earlier that day when he'd been using them. So this means that after all of these grounds being covered they had no option but just to pretty much sit there and watch the house burn down until the fire department got there and they said they ended up just standing there and watching the house burn down for about 45 minutes. Because of this they assumed that the five children had died in the fire, um, although I don't, they didn't hear any screams or anything which is kind of weird but yeah they just assumed that they had perished. So it was Christmas Eve night and the fire department were loan resources so it said that they didn't um, they couldn't actually physically respond to the call until uh, later that morning. One of Jenny Sodder's brothers was part of the fire department that were on call that um, came to help the fire. But because they were too late, the fire had already pretty much burnt everything down. It had gone out. Um, by the time they got there later that morning, all the fire department could do was go through the ashes um, of the burnt down house and see what they could find, see if they could find the children, uh, any remnants to suggest that the children had died. The important names of the fire department staff uh, was Chief F.J. Morris and he said, uh, I think it was around 10am, that when they searched for the ashes they couldn't find any, any bones, any signs of human remains in the leftovers of the fire. However, it said that one account, someone um, possibly who worked in the fire department, I don't know, it's just said that someone 
um, that was on the scene said that they actually did find some bone fragments and internal organ parts but they chose not to tell the sodders and hid them. So despite telling the sodders that they found no evidence of human remains, Chief Morris himself believed that the children had died um, because he, he believed that the fire had been hot enough just to burn them completely. They were told to leave the site alone, um, not touch it because then they could conduct a more thorough investigation when they had the resources, obviously it's still Christmas. After four days of waiting, George decided to bulldoze the entire area where the house had been and make like a memorial garden for the lost children. The day after that, the local coroner issued a statement, a final statement, to say that the fire was a result of faulty wiring, sorry, which sits really funny with me and I'll go into it a bit why it doesn't sit right with me um, a bit later. Obviously I know some of the contradiction evidence so I'll get into that in a bit. Court case that was coming to this conclusion, one of the jurors um, was actually a man who threatened George, I think it was earlier that year. He threatened George by saying that his house would be burned down and his children would perish um, just because of anti-Mussolini beliefs and outspoken anti-Mussolini rants. So it was a pretty specific threat considering what happened, but he was on the jury deciding um, how to label the cause of the fire. So obviously it was then decided that faulty wiring was the cause. On the 30th of December, um, the official death certificates of the five children, five children? I've already lost it. Yeah, so the final death certificates of the five children were um, sent out on the 30th. And then after this, the Sodders just generally became really, really suspicious of everything that had gone down and um, they started kind of conducting their own investigation as to why because they wanted to find out the truth they didn't believe that all of this was just down to an accident so my biggest issue and I have this written down of the faulty wiring claim um, if it was a result of electrical issues so faulty wiring um, it said that the Christmas lights continued to stay on until the fire got to them so if the fire started as faulty wiring, why were other lights on? Why why were other lights working when it was obviously all connected? And the fuse box, I just... Yeah. They also found the missing ladder about 23 metres away from where it should have been um, by the house. It was found in the bottom of an embankment. 23 metres away, that's like... It's not like they could have misplaced it. Um, it, was ob it seemed like it was obviously put there on purpose to hide it so they couldn't use it. They hired a telephone repairman to come look at um, the telephone line as to why it wasn't working that night. And he said that the phone line hadn't been damaged by the fire but it had actually been cut purposely. Now to do this someone would have had to have climbed up about four, I think it's 4.3 metres up a pole and then reach across a, another like 60 centimetres or something to do so. So they couldn't have accidentally cut this telephone line or they could have, yeah it was, it was something that you had to have intended to do because it wasn't easy. There was a man that had been seen um, stealing, I think it was block and tackle, um, on the property at the time of the fire. When he was caught, he admitted to the theft. He said that he was, yeah, he was there to steal this tackle. Um, and he said he cut the phone line, mistaking it for the power line, which I don't, yeah, I'll get into that again in a bit. But he completely denied having any involvement to the fire, which I, I do kind of believe in a way, because I just think if you if you're, if you're confessing to all that, why why deny the fire? You might as well just, you know, confess to being part of that if you were. When they looked into this man, however, though, they said there was no record of him ever existing, which is weird in itself. It's very weird. And also, if he was stealing um, block and tackle from the property, not necessarily the house, he was stealing it from, like, the property, um, why did he need to cut the power line? That's, yeah. Hmm, this is a bit funny. However, Jenny said that she was in some ways grateful that he did mistakenly cut the telephone line because... If he'd cut the power line like he said he intended to, they would. she said that none of them would have ever gotten out of the house. They wouldn't have been able to see their way out and um, they would have all perished. And Jenny also said that she really struggled to accept Chief Morris's belief that um, all the children's bodies had been completely burned in the fire because she said that um, a lot of household appliances were found in the ashes and they were recognisable. Like they were burned but not that badly. So... Um, it would, she said it would take a lot more for a body to be completely burned. And it's also said that there was a fire that occurred around the same time where all seven members of the family in that fire, in that house, were killed, but all of their remains were found in the ashes. So when she was really suspicious about this fire burning all the bodies, she contacted someone who worked at the crematorium, like nearby the local crematorium, 
and um, I have the information here. The person who worked at the crematorium told her that human bones would still remain there even if they were burned at over 1090 degrees celsius for two hours which is far way way longer um and hotter than the fire had burned for so i think i said they stood for about 45 or so minutes watching the fire burn um so the fire would have been uh, needed to have been a lot hotter and burn for a lot longer for human remains to be completely burned to the extent where they're just ash. George said that he believed that the trucks he tried to use to pull up to the house to try and get the children out had been tampered with because they'd been working fine earlier that day when he was using them for his work. Um, I think some that since the investigation some people have said that it is possible that in, in the panic and the hurry um, him and his sons could have flooded the engines or something but I don't know it just seems that everything else seemed to have been tampered with so why not the trucks. There was also some theories that the, the strange the odd phone call um, that she received earlier in the night could have been related um saying that maybe they were just testing to make sure like someone called up to make sure they were in the house but um i think the police actually tracked down the woman who made the phone call and she said that it was just a complete mistake it was a wrong number she'd called the wrong number looking for someone else but all of that seems a bit weird to me i don't know like i said it doesn't sit right um like i said george bulldozed over the house and they planted flowers in this memorial garden in the spring after time and you know, after like a month or so but eventually as time passed more and more things surfaced that suggested their initial skepticism of the final reports were true like they they had reason to not believe what they'd been told first off there was a bus driver that had been driving through Fayetteville at the time on Christmas Eve and he said he saw people throwing what he claimed were balls of fire towards the house which is very strange but also, a lot of people are like, why would he lie? What what, what reason would this random bus driver have to lie about this? Then a few months later, so in the spring, when all the snow in the area had melted, um, Sylvia, the youngest child, found a small ball, and it was a small, hard, dark green rubber ball-like object in the bush nearby the house, which links with this ball for fire claim. When George linked this with his wife, Jenny's um, recount of the night, when she said that she heard something uh, hitting the roof and then rolling, he decided, um, he came to the belief that it was something called a pineapple bomb hand grenade, which would suggest that someone had intentionally thrown these at the roof so that the fire started in the roof, which is contrary to what they've been told. They've been told, I think, that it was in the office and um, that the faulty wiring, I think maybe in the basement. Time passed and the investigation continued. There have been witnesses that have come forward to claim that they have seen the children since the night of the fire. One woman said that she was watching the fire from the road nearby and she saw children, the children, um, peering out of a passing car while the house was burning, going past her on the road, which, um, that's very weird. Another woman said she was at a rest stop, she was working at a rest stop between Fayetteville and a nearby town, Charleston, and she said she served the children breakfast the next morning on Christmas Day and she recalled them getting into a car with Florida a license plate. With a Florida license plate. These accounts came forward. The Sodders decided just to hire their own private investigator because they couldn't trust um, what they'd been told by the police and the fire department said so they just decided to do their own research because they thought they could trust that more. So they hired a PI named C.C. Tinsley and when he did his investigation he found out that the man on the jury like i said earlier had been the man threatening george he'd also heard rumors that chief morris found a heart amongst the the ashes of the burning house and decided to hide it so he hid it in a box and he secretly buried it and it's said that apparently chief morris had confessed this to a minister in the town so when they called him up on it pretty much he decided to t he agreed just to take them to where he buried it um they dug up this box where the heart, human heart had allegedly been, took it to a funeral director in the town who found that it was in fact a fresh beef liver and it had never ever been exposed to fire so it was a complete lie. Rumours came about after this when people found out and said that basically they believed that Morris had lied about it and then he later apparently admitted that it was, wasn't was true so I don't know what he was doing there. A lot of people thought that he'd hoped the Sodders would find this and um, be satisfied that they with the with the idea that their children had died and they'd stop investigating there. But they didn't do this, and George in, um, continued just to take his own 
investigation. So he said he, f he followed up every single lead he, he had or he came across in person. So first up, he said he saw a girl in a magazine that he thought looked like his daughter Betty and travelled to New York City to find this girl because he believed it to be Betty. And then in 1949, pathologists from Washington DC decided to come over and supervise a dig through the dirt where they'd built the memorial garden. So he decided to sift through all the ashes again underneath the dirt of the burnt house. So he found um, some of the children's belongings and what he believed to be small bone fragments. So um, initially they assumed these to be human vertebrae. They were sent over to the Smith. Oh my god, I can't say this. <laughs> sent over to the Smithsonian's. Oh my god. They were sent over to the Smithsonian Institution, um, where they were investigated, and it was found to be lumbar vertebrae, which means that all the bone fragments were believed to be from the same person. But it was said that this person was believed to be around 16 or 17 years old, which means that it couldn't have been from any of the children because the eldest. Um, of the missing children was 14, uh, Maurice. And also the bone fragments didn't appear to be to have been exposed to any sims of fire, so it's unlikely that they were actually there when the house burnt down. So the likeliest explanation is that they had been put there afterwards, after um, the house had burnt down. And it's also very strange that these are the only parts that have been found um, since all, all of the children, if this had been from the children, um, all of the children would have been exposed to the same fire so surely there would be parts from each of them but no so it's pretty much guaranteed that these aren't from the missing children. A few years later um, the case was officially dropped by uh, authorities so the Sodders were officially continuing on the case alone. Initially they began posting uh, flies about um, offering a reward for any any help from anyone like eyewitness accounts or anything and they eventually put up a billboard in 1952 so it became very public and they were literally just reaching out for any sort of help. To another witness I have here someone called Ida Crutchfield she ran a hotel in Charleston which was the nearby town she said apparently she saw them approximately a week after the fire so she said I do not remember the exact date but they came in around midnight with two men and two women when she tried to speak to the to one of the children one of the men looked at me in a hostile manner, he turned around and began talking rapidly in Italian, immediately the whole party stopped talking to me. However, even though this seems quite, sort of, interesting, um, it's believed, like widely believed that this isn't a very credible resource and she only saw pictures of the children two years after the fire and then she came forward five years after that, so um, I, I'm not entirely sure why she would wait that long and if she'd still fully recognise the children. So it's not a very credible source, so there's not really much they can do with that. So like there were loads of different accounts where people have believed they'd saw, seen the children a few years later. 1967, George travelled to Houston to follow up a tip where um, a woman had told had told them that there was a man who'd been drunk and he'd told them and he'd confessed that his true identity was actually Louis Sodder. Louis was the nine year old that was believed uh, to be lost in the fire. So when it was investigated they couldn't find the woman that made this claim but they did find the two men who were claiming to be Louis and Maurice who actually denied that they were these are their true identities initially and then one day Jenny received a letter. The letter had no return address and it had stamped it had been stamped in Kentucky and in the letter there was a photo. Now I'll have a photo on the screen. The picture had a man who was around 30. So I just believed he had a very strong resemblance to Louis. And then on the back, the words written were Louis Sodder, I love brother Frankie, I lil boys, A90132 or 35. So a lot of that's quite gibberish, I don't personally know what that means. <laughs> um, so they hired another private investigator to um, look into this because obviously they believed quite strongly that this was their son. But when he, he was sent off to investigate, he never reported back, they never heard from him again. So I don't know what happened there, whether he ran off with their money or whether he found something, who knows. Because they had this picture, the picture continued to give the Sodders hope, so they continued to believe that this was Louis. They held on to this hope until about 1969 when George Sodder died. Right, so my camera just died, I'm sorry if it's in a different position, but where were we? So the eldest son, John, who was the 23-year-old who escaped with the family during the fire, is the only one who's said to not talk about the fire and he's said that he, he openly says that he believes that the family should move on with their lives because they've spent so many years investigating and nothing's come of it. However, um, even after George's death in 1969, Jenny and all the other children continued 
not necessarily their investigations, but they just continued to seek any answers they could find. After George died, it's said that Jenny continued to live in the family home, um, and it's actually, <laughs> there, are, there are accounts that say a lot of people believe that she just continued to wore black every day in mourning of the children, and she checked on the garden daily, she tended to the flowers over the house, and um, she spent, she lived her lives just in mourning of these lost children. Now, theories wise, there's a lot of theories, obviously, I think, I'm sure you guys will agree, I personally feel something was intentional here because it just all seems too weird to be a coincidence. So there are theories including um, Sicilian Mafia uh, trying to extort money from George for years apparently. I believe that someone knew of the upcoming arson plan. This could either be someone intentionally setting the fire and taking the children away in hopes of using them for ransom or in hopes of people investigating and um, spending loads of money on it as a result of George not complying with the Mafia or there's also believed, it's quite widely believed, that someone knew of the upcoming arson issue plan and someone took the children before anything could happen to them and um, hid them and took them to safety which is kind of a nice thought I guess and the people who believe that, that um, idea that the children were taken to safety they say that the children in later years avoided contacting them because they believed that they were still at risk and danger um, so they said that if they start their new lives they wouldn't contact the sodders because that could put them in further risk so that's kind of the, the main theory the most widely believed theory I think it's kind of the most probable as well I think I can see that kind of being quite um, believable and it said that through years all the children until their deaths they all continued to share the story in hopes of finding their lost siblings and I, I believe to this day Sylvia the two year old at the time is the only one alive um, I couldn't find much on her but I believe yes she's still alive so that is the case of the disappearance of the five sort of children let me know what you guys think I think this is probably one of the most interesting cases I've read in a long time there are a lot a lot of things to suggest that this wasn't an accident and I personally don't believe it was an accident but I don't know let me know what you guys think down below and if there are any details or anything that I missed um I'd love I love seeing discussions going on so yes I hope you found this fascinating and I'll see you guys soon for another video bye